Section 7 of The Cricket on the Hearth by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Jason Isbell. The Cricket on the Hearth by Charles Dickens. Chirp the Third. The Dutch clock in the corner struck ten when the carrier sat down by his fireside, so troubled and grief-worn that he seemed to scare the cuckoo, who, having cut his ten melodious announcements as short as possible, plunged back into the Moorish palace again and clapped his little door behind him, as if the unwanted spectacle were too much for his feelings. If the little haymaker had been armed with the sharpest of scythes, and had cut at every stroke into the carrier's heart, he never could have gashed or wounded it as Dot had done. It was a heart so full of love for her, so bound up and held together by innumerable threads of winning remembrance, spun from the daily workings of her many qualities of endearment. It was a heart in which she had enshrined herself so gently and so closely, a heart so single and so earnest in its truth, so strong in right, so weak in wrong, that it could cherish neither passion nor revenge at first, and had only room to hold the broken image of its idol. But slowly, slowly, as the carrier sat brooding on his heart, now cold and dark, other and fiercer thoughts began to rise within him, as an angry wind came rising in the night. The stranger was beneath his outraged roof. Three steps would take him to his chamber door. One blow would beat it in. You might do murder before you know it, Tackleton had said. How could it be murder if he gave the villain time to grapple with him hand to hand? He was the younger man. It was an ill-timed thought bad for the dark mood in his mind. It was an angry thought, goading him to some avenging act that should change the cheerful house into a haunted place which lonely travelers would dread to pass by night, and where the timid would see shadows struggling in the ruined windows when the moon was dim, and hear wild noises in the stormy weather. He was the younger man, yes, yes some lover who had won the heart that he had never touched, some lover of her early choice, of whom she had thought and dreamed, for whom she had pined and pined, when he had fancied her so happy by his side. Oh, agony to think of it! She had been above stairs with the baby, getting it in bed, as he sat brooding on the hearth. She came close beside him, without his knowledge. In the turning of the rack of his great misery, he lost all other sounds, and put her little stool at his feet. He only knew it when he felt her hand upon his own, and saw her looking into his face. With wonder? No, it was his first impression, and he was fain to look at her again, to set it right. No, not with wonder, with an eager and inquiring look, but not with wonder. At first it was alarmed and serious, then it changed into a strange, wild, dreadful smile of recognition of his thoughts. Then there was nothing but her clasped hand at his brow, and her bent head, and falling hair. Though the power of omnipotence had been his to wield at that moment, he had too much of its diviner property of mercy in his breast to have turned one feather's weight of it against her. But he could not bear to see her crooning down upon the little seat where he had often looked on her with love and pride, so innocent and gay. And when she rose and left him, sobbing as she went, he felt it a relief to have the vacant place beside him rather than her so long-cherished presence. This in itself was an anguish keener than all, reminding him how desolate he has become, 
and how the great bond of his life was rent asunder. The more he felt this, and the more he knew he could have better borne to see her lying prematurely dead before him with her little child upon her breast, the higher and the stronger rose his wrath against his enemy. He looked about him for a weapon. There was a gun hanging on the wall. He took it down and moved a pace or two toward the door of the perfidious stranger's room. He knew the gun was loaded. Some shadowy idea that it was just to shoot this man like a wild beast seized him, and dilated in his mind until it grew into a monstrous demon in complete possession of him, casting out all milder thoughts and setting up its undivided empire. That phrase is wrong not casting out his milder thoughts, but artfully transforming them, changing them into scourges to drive him on, turning water into blood, love into hate, gentleness into blind ferocity, her image souring, humbled, but still pleading to his tenderness and mercy with relentless power, never left his mind. But staying there, it urged him to the door, raised the weapon to his shoulder, fitted and nerved his finger to the trigger, and cried, Kill him in his bed. He reversed the gun to beat the stock against the door. He already held it lifted in the air, some indistinct design when it is in his thoughts of calling out to him to fly, for God's sake, by the window. When suddenly... The struggling fire illuminated the whole chimney with a glow of light, and the cricket on the hearth began to chirp. No sound he could have heard, no human voice, not even hers, could so have moved and softened him. The artful words in which she had told him of her love and for this same cricket were once more freshly spoken. Her trembling, earnest manner at the moment was again before him. Her pleasant voice, oh, what a voice it was for making household music at the fireside of an honest man, thrilled through and through his better nature and awoke it into life and action. He recoiled from the door, like a man walking in his sleep, awakened from a frightful dream and put the gun aside. Clasping his hands before his face, he then sat down beside the fire and found relief in tears. The cricket on the hearth came out into the room and stood in fiery shape before him. I love it, said the fairy voice, repeating what he well remembered. For the many times I have heard it, and the many thoughts its harmless music has given me. She said so, cried the carrier. True. This has been a happy home, John, and I love the crickets for its sake. It has been, heaven knows, returned the carrier. She made it happy, always, until now. So gracefully sweet-tempered, so domestic, joyful, busy, and light-hearted, said the voice. Otherwise I never could have loved her as I did, returned the carrier. The voice, corrected him, said, do. The carrier repeated, as I did, but not firmly. His faltering tongue resisted his control and would speak in its own way for itself and him. The figure, in an attitude of invocation, raised its hand and said, Upon your own hearth. The hearth she has blighted, interposed the carrier. The hearth she has, how often, blessed and brightened said the cricket. The heart which, but for her, would only a few stones and bricks and rusty bars, but which has been, through her, the altar of your home, on which you have nightly sacrificed some petty passion, selfishness, or care, and offered up the homage of a tranquil mind, a trusting nature, and an overflowing heart so that the smoke from this poor chimney has gone upward with a better fragrance 
than the richest incense that is burned upon the richest shrines in all the gaudy temples of this world, upon your own hearth, in its quiet sanctuary, surrounded by its gentle influence and association. Hear her, hear me, hear everything that speaks the language of your hearth and home. And pleads for her, inquired the carrier, all things that speak the language of your hearth and home must plead for her, returned the cricket, for they speak the truth. And while the carrier, with his head upon his hands, continued to sit meditating in his chair, the presence stood before him, suggesting his reflections by its power, and presenting them before him as in a glass or picture. It was not a solitary presence. From the hearthstone, from the chimney, from the clock, the pipe, the kettle, and the cradle, from the floor, the walls, the ceiling, and the stairs, from the cart without and the cupboard within, and the household implements, from everything and every place with which she had ever been familiar, with which she had ever entwined one recollection of herself in her unhappy husband's mind, fairies came trooping forth, not to stand beside him as the cricket did, but to busy and bestir themselves, to do all honor to her image, to pull him by the skirts and point to it when it appeared, to cluster round it and embrace it, and strew flowers for it to tread on, to try to crown its fair head with their tiny hands, to show that they were fond of it and loved it, and that there was not one ugly, wicked, or accusatory creature to claim knowledge of it, none but their playful and approving selves. His thoughts were constant to her image. It was always there. She sat plying her needle before the fire and singing to herself, such a blithe, thriving, steady little dot. The fairy figures turned upon him all at once, by one consent, with one prodigious, concentrated stare, and seemed to say, Is this the light wife you are mourning for? There were sounds of gaiety outside musical instruments and noisy tongues and laughter a crowd of young merrymakers came pouring in among whom were may fielding and a score of pretty girls dot was the fairest of them all as young as any of them too they came to summon her to join their party it was a dance if ever little feet were made for dancing hers were surely but she laughed and shook her head and pointed to her cookery on the fire and her table ready spread, with an exulting defiance that rendered her more charming than she was before, and so she merrily dismissed them, nodding to her would-be partners, one by one as they passed out, with a comical indifference, enough to make them go and drown themselves immediately if they were her admirers, and they must have been so, more or less, they couldn't help it, and yet indifference was not her character. Oh no, for presently there came a certain carrier to the door, and, bless her, what a welcome she bestowed upon him. Again the staring figures turned upon him all at once, and seemed to say, Is this the wife who has forsaken you? A shadow fell upon the mirror or the picture. Call it what you will, a great shadow of the stranger, as he first stood underneath their roof covering his surface and blotting out all other objects, but the nimble fairies worked like bees to clear it off again, and Dot again was there, still bright and beautiful, rocking her little baby in its cradle, singing to it softly, and wrestling her head upon a shoulder which had its counterpart in the musing figure by which the fairy cricket stood. The night, I mean the real night, not going by fairy clocks, was wearing now, and in this stage of the carrier's thoughts the moon burst out and shone brightly in the sky, 
Perhaps some calm and quiet light had risen also in his mind, and he could think more soberly of what had happened. Although the shadow of the stranger fell at intervals upon the glass, always distinct and big and thoroughly defined, it never fell do so darkly as at first. Whenever it appeared, the fairies uttered a general cry of consternation and plied their little arms and legs with inconceivable activity to rub it out, and whenever they got at Dot again and showed her to him once more, bright and beautiful, they cheered in the most inspiring manner. They never showed her otherwise than beautiful and bright, for they were household spirits to whom falsehood is an annihilation, and being so what Dot was there for them, but the one active, beaming, pleasant little creature who had been the light and sun of the carrier's home. The fairies were prodigiously excited when they showed her, with the baby gossiping among the knot of sage old matrons, and affecting to be wondrous old and matronly herself, and leaning in a staid, demure old way on her husband's arm, attempting, she, such a bud of a little woman, to convey the idea of having adjured the vanities of the world in general, and of being the sort of person to whom it was no novelty at all to be a mother. Yet, in the same breath, they showed her, laughing at the carrier for being awkward, and pulling up his shirt-collar to make him smart, and mincing merrily about the very room to teach him how to dance. They turned and stared immensely at him when they showed her with the blind girl for though she carried cheerfulness and animation with her wherever she went she bore those influences into caleb plummer's home heaped up and running over the blind girl's love for her and trust in her and gratitude to her her own good busy way of setting bertha's thanks aside her dexterous little arts for filling up each moment of the visit in doing something useful to the house and really working hard while feigning to make holiday, her bountiful provision of those standing delicacies, the veal and ham pie and the bottles of beer, her radiant little face arriving at the door and taking leave, the wonderful expression of her whole self, from her neat foot to the crown of her head, of being part of the establishment, a something necessary to it, which it couldn't be without. All this the fairies reveled in, and loved her for, and once again they looked upon him all at once, appealingly, and seemed to say, while some among them nestled in her dress and fondled her, Is this the wife who betrayed your confidence? More than once, or twice, or thrice, in a long thoughtful night, they showed her to him sitting on her favorite seat, with her bent head her hands clasped to her brow, her falling hair, as he had seen her last, and when they found her thus, they neither turned nor looked upon him, but gathered close round her and comforted and kissed her, and pressed on one another to show sympathy and kindness to her, and forget him altogether. Thus the night passed, the moon went down, the stars grew pale, the cold day broke, the sun rose. The carrier sat still, musing, in the chimney corner. He had sat there with his head upon his hands all night. All night the faithful cricket had been chirp, chirp, chirping on the hearth. All night he had been listening to its voice. All night the household fairies had been busy with him. All night she had been amiable and blameless in the glass, except when that one shadow fell upon it. He rose up when it was broad day, and washed and dressed himself. He couldn't go about his customary cheerful avocations. He wanted spirit for them. But it mattered the less that it was Tackleton's wedding day, and he had arranged to make his rounds by proxy. He had thought to have gone merrily to church with Dot, 
but such plans were at an end. It was their wedding day, too. Ah, how little he had looked for such a close to such a year. The carrier expected that Tackleton would pay him an early visit, and he was right. He had walked to and fro before his own door many minutes when he saw the toy merchant coming in his chase along the road. As the chase drew nearer, he perceived that Tackleton was dressed out sprucely for his marriage, and that he had decorated his horse's heads with flowers and favors. The horse looked much more like a bridegroom than Tackleton, whose half-closed eyes were more disagreeably expressive than ever. But the carrier took little heed of this. His thoughts had other occupation. "'John Perrybingle,' said Tackleton with an air of condolence. "'My good fellow, how do you find yourself this morning?' "'I have had a poor night, Mr. Tackleton.' returned the carrier, shaking his head, for I have been a good deal disturbed in my mind. But it is over now. Can you spare me half an hour or so for some private talk? I came on purpose, returned Tackleton, al alighting. Never mind the horse. He'll stand quiet enough with the reins over the post if you'll give him a mouthful of hay. The carrier, having brought it from his stable and set it before him, they turned into the house. "'You are not married before noon,' he said, I think. "'No,' said Tackleton. "'Plenty of time, plenty of time.' When they entered the kitchen, Tilly Slowboy was rapping at the stranger's door, which was only removed from it by a few steps. One of her very red eyes, for Tilly had been crying all night long, because her mistress cried, was at the keyhole and she was knocking very loud and seemed frightened. "'If you please, I can't make nobody hear,' said Tilly, looking round. "'I hope nobody ain't gone in and been and dead, if you please.' This philanthropic wish Miss Slowboy emphasized with various new raps and kicks at the door, which led to no result whatsoever. "'Shall I go?' said Tackleton. "'It's curious.' The carrier, who had turned his face from the door, signed him to go if he would. So Tackleton went to Tilly Slowboy's relief, and he too kicked and knocked, and he too failed to get the least reply. But he thought of trying the handle of the door, and, as it opened easily, he pipped in, looked in, went in, and soon came running out. "'John Perry Bingle!' said Tackleton in his ear. I hope there has been nothing, nothing rash in the night. The carrier turned upon him quickly. Because he's gone, said Tackleton, and the window's open. I don't see any marks, to be sure. It's almost on a level with the garden. But I was afraid there might have been some, some scuffle, eh? He nearly shut up the expressive eye altogether. He looked at him so hard and he gave his eye and his face and his whole person a sharp twist, as if he would have screwed the truth out of him. "'Make yourself easy,' said the carrier. "'He went into that room last night without harm in word or deed from me, and no one has entered it since. He is away of his own free will. I'd go out gladly at that door and beg my bread from house to house for life, if I could so change the past that he had never come. But he has come and gone, and I have done with him. Oh, well, I think he has got off pretty easy, said Tackleton, taking a chair. The sneer was lost upon the carrier, who sat down too and shaded his face with his hand for some little time before proceeding. You showed me last night, he said at length, my wife, my wife that I love, secretly and tenderly insinuated tackleton conniving at that man's disguise and giving him opportunities of meeting her alone i think there's no sight i wouldn't have rather seen than that i think there's no man in the world i wouldn't have rather had to show at me i confess to having my suspicions already 
said Tackleton. And that has made me objectionable here, I know. But as you did show it me, pursued the carrier, not minding him, and as you saw her, my wife, my wife that I love, his voice and eye and hand grew steadier and firmer as he repeated these words, evidently in pursuance of a steadfast purpose. As you saw her at this disadvantage, it is right and just that you should also see with my eyes, and look into my breast, and know that my mind is upon the subject, for it's settled, said the carrier, regarding him attentively, and nothing can shake it now. Tackleton muttered a few general words of assent about it being necessary to vindicate something or another, but he was overwhelmed by the manner of his companion, plain and unpolished as it was. It had a something dignified and noble in it, which nothing but the soul of a generous honor dwelling in the man could have imparted. End of section 7 Recorded by Jason Isbell www.shabamdevelopment.com